I think the Constitution was designed to obstruct. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Constitution. I won't criticize the Constitution. But you had, the United States had gained independence and um, had not yet brought the Constitution. There was an extended period from 1776 to 18, 1787 where we operated as a confederation. And the important documents of that era were the state constitutions. And the most radical of those state constitutions was in Pennsylvania. It created the assembly. There wasn't a governor. I think it was a 15-person committee taking the role as the executive. There were not two houses of Congress. There was only one. It was unicameral. And that was to, to make sure that it was responsive to the needs of the people. So it was a much more shall I use the word, democratic document. And the, the wealthy folks at that time, many of which I have learned a lot about, admire, uh, really set about to block that kind of thing. They replaced mm -hmm. Pennsylvania's com constitution with uh, one that had uh, two ha houses and a single governor. And in that mechanism, it was much easier to block legislation. And so by the time 1787 came around, uh, they knew how to design a document that gave some democracy in terms of the election of the House of Representatives. But senators, as you know, were elected by state legislatures. And the president was elected by an electoral college. Mm -hmm. there, there was very much the intention to construct a document that didn't let things get out of hand, that mm -hmm. that that caused change to occur slowly rather than rapidly. And so, you know, I think that's what we still have today. It's it was it was designed to make things easy to block. Mm -hmm. And it's still easy to block things. <laughs> and so I think the more fundamental question is, do we want a system where it's less easy to block something? And if the answer to that question is yes, we probably do need to make some very fundamental changes. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Richard Vake, who not only is an INET board member, but an author and was the Secretary of uh, Banking and Securities in the state of Pennsylvania, and uh, just a person who I think has a tremendous amount of insight into political economy. I'm very interested in this new book, The Illustrated business history of the United States. Richard, thanks for joining me. And uh, I guess we'll start with what inspired you to write this book? Well, first, I have to say thank you to you for or having me here today. Uh, yours is a great podcast, and I've enjoyed so many of the things that, that you've put forward. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. You know, with all our research on financial crisis, one thing that became clear was there really wasn't a lot of data or information about early American business history. We could find fragments of it here and there. And I had real curiosity about how sophisticated or unsophisticated the beginnings of U.S. business were, going back to you know the Constitution in 1787, the first bank in the United States, and so forth. And so we confirmed that not much had been put together in terms of the hard data about uh, manufacturing, banking, and the like. And we proceeded to put that together. Now, we did a lot of fun things along the way. Sure we did. reconstructed lists of who the wealthiest individuals were in each era, and what imports and exports were, uh, the key inventions. Uh, but, you know, we had to do a lot of digging to find your, the early American business history. Yeah, and you carried on that how they say multifaceted expression right up through 2015. So we get to see the, what you might call modern incarnation of the, of the tradition of innovators and leaders. And even I, I got to shed a tear because I watched the decline in the uh, size of the city of Detroit, where I grew up, because each chapter you show the, where are the largest cities and Detroit's drops right out of the top 10. And, uh, but, uh, but I thought the, uh, how would I say, relative to many scholarly histories, this was much more accessible 
the modes of connection that you created with, with visual things, with people, with personalities, as well as with the structure of commerce. What is it that you see? You know, one, one of the things that I think is very interesting right now, a lot of people are obviously very concerned about climate change. And there is kind of one school of thought, which is talking as though we have to reset our preferences and we have to, how do I say, uh, govern properly, part of which is it's setting incentives. But the other is a look into what the private sector, the deliverer of these commodities and services, and in this case, transformation, bring to bear. And the acknowledgement that large business organizations are often the vehicles of change. They have to work perhaps in conjunction with government or what have you. But uh, I'm curious, I guess the, the meta question is, about the dance between the private sector and the state that you saw evolve through the chapters? Well, that's a great question and a great subject because there's a lot of folks, particularly over the last couple of decades, that talk about, you know, laissez-faire and, you know, get government out of the way of business and your business will seek and find the right things to do. And when you look at American history, it's never been that way. Mm -hmm. There was never this mythical laissez-faire period of American business. American business has, I think, largely benefited from what you might call an industrial policy since the very beginning. Alexander yes. Hamilton, you know, when he wrote his famous mm -hmm. three reports in 1790 and 91, uh, one of the things he boosted as part of that was manufacturing. Well, he was instrumental in seeking talent from the UK to bring to the United States, sometimes in contravention to British law, by the way, uh, to, to populate uh, a new industrial uh, sector within the United States. We see the United States government uh, taking a huge position, by the way, through the federal and through the state governments, huge position in ca canals, uh, the mm -hmm. fledgling railroad industry was a huge beneficiary of government support at the mm -hmm. Illinois Central Railroad and the Transcontinental Railroad and many, many other places. You know, we bring that all the way to today. We see, and I think uh, the work of a number of economists have shown this, where even the iPhone, all the major subcomponents of the iPhone have come directly or indirectly from government-sponsored research or government policy and the like. That's the Internet itself, obviously, mm -hmm. the old ARPANET, that's touchscreen technology, that's GPS, uh, that's the like. So the U.S. government has strategically pointed business in certain directions throughout U.S. history, which to me means it can do it again. And mm -hmm. it can do it in relative to things like climate change. And as, as daunting of an issue as that is, I think there's hope if we can align government and business around that issue. Yeah. Well, I've seen a number of examples uh, as I was listening to you. It occurred uh, a gentleman, uh, the late Felix Rowan, had a book called Bold Endeavors, which was about, I think, 10 or 11, I think it was 11 cases of where the state had made a difference. Highway systems, canals, among others. But uh, And that interface between the state is very prominent in our fellow board member uh, Bill Janeway's new series on the INET website about uh, economics of innovation and venture capital. There's uh, his father wrote a book about war preparation, the struggle for survival, Elliot Janeway, about the Roosevelt years preparing for World War II. So there's a lot of precedent, but I think there's something that's very interesting right now that's, that's a formidable challenge, which is for many years, say at the time of Poliani's great transformation, people were talking about more state or less state, and people on the left were the more state. In recent years, there's been a cynicism about the role of money in politics, and many people on the left in surveys show that they have no confidence that the state is any longer representative of the well-being of people, that it's been captured. The financial bailout uh, and the great financial crisis was a lightning rod 
of suspicion uh, in that regard. And uh, I don't think myself, and you can, you're welcome to differ with me, that uh, we could have stood by and not done the bailout. I think everybody would have gone down with the ship and had to preserve the financial sector in order to have a chance for recovery and repair. But nonetheless, that cynicism, whether it's in Gallup polls or books like Ben Page writes, suggesting that uh, surveys where the top 10% of the population differs from the bottom 90 in terms of wealth or income, uh, that the legislature follows the top 10%'s recommendations all the time. And so how we, I guess I'm asking you in a, in a long-winded way, how do we jumpstart trust in the state as a leader here again? <laughs> well, you, you just described one of the most difficult problems I can think of. You know, if folks are cynical about business, if folks are cynical about government's invol involvement in business, they have a lot of justification for having that view. You know, from the very beginning of U.S. business history, and, you know, probably back as far as we can look in time, there has been corruption, there has been fraud. You know, for every great victory and great advancement that business has brought, there have been, you know, many things that go in the other direction. And for every enlightened thing that government has done, uh, there has been an equal number of areas where government has produced outcomes that aren't that desirable. So, you know, there's there's a lot there that would create the cynicism that folks might feel. Nevertheless, the examples of where good has been achieved are glorious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I, I think the burden is, personally, I think the burden is on government uh, to do some good things because that yeah. alone will create a cycle that will reinforce our ability to trust government. And the cynicism is deep seated. You know, as you and I have discussed, I spent a lot of time going around the country talking to, you know, uh, folks, middle Americans or average Americans about that. And uh, the cynicism and distrust is there and it's, it's pervasive. And I think it's time for government to step up and do some really profoundly good things. I think that that's the kind of thing that can set things right. Yeah. I think the, uh, Obviously, the Biden administration espoused what you may call the awareness of that challenge, particularly after the January 6th uh, problems around the Capitol. And uh, seeing people on both sides of the aisle, if you will, expressing concern and cynicism, uh, I guess we've got within the legislature, within the two-party system, we've got to get over some of the rivalrous propensities and rally together to, to realize that proof. But uh, there, there, there's a lot of what you might call cocktail party cynicism, even among elites now, as to whether this can be achieved. But everybody's yearning for it. Everybody's yearning for some good news. And one of the things I found refreshing about this book is that we can get a little too caught in our Zoom lens what's going on now and what are we suspicious of but to see those cycles of what you might call the marvelous and the excess and how it evolves is kind of refreshing that it's it's not necessarily all bad news and yeah there's there's a lot of good there which uh you've got 14 chapters in the book different segments in time it's chronological where did you find the most excitement in the, who, who did you admire as people, what sectors and their development were most positively surprising as you conducted this study? Well, there's a lot of obvious heroes, uh, you know, Thomas Edison, uh, you know, with his tousled mm -hmm. hair and his absentmindedness and, you know, was, was certainly a great example. You know, I look back, you know, one of the individuals that has become one of my favorites is uh, Thomas Willing, who was uh, the first great banker in the United States, uh, going back all the way to the beginning. So uh, there's a lot of uh, great things that have happened. To me, you know, there's a lot of business history that we know very, very well. You know, the, the boom in the 20s and the crash in the Great Depression. 
you know, everybody knows that story. You know, the manufacturing being marshaled to help World War II. Everybody knows that story. So mm-hmm. the, the my areas that were the favorite for me in the book were the less traveled paths. You know, mm-hmm. the you know, the business around circa nineteen hundred and nineteen ten. You know, there was as much going on uh, there as in any period of history. It's just an area that folks haven't spent a lot of time in. You know, the the Great Canal area era in the eighteen thirties, mm-hmm. you know, something folk most folks aren't aware of. So I think the book really, my most fun in the book was exploring areas that I had less familiarity with. Was there ever a place that uh, you discovered that you had come into it thinking it was good news and found out it really wasn't so good? Well, I think, you know, I I came out of the 80s. You know, that was my first job in banking was in the late 1970s and I was present in the 80s, you know, the era of Reagan. And I think today folks still, many folks still look back at that as, you know, as was uh, expressed in his campaign, the mourning in America and a resurgence and this, that, and the other. That's you know, mourning going, without the you, right? <laughs> well said. But at any rate, to, to go back and examine it, you find that that was one of the most crisis laden periods in American history. And uh, so, you know, that was one of the obvious ones to me that that where where what I found was very different than I think the popular perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked in the United States Senate Banking Committee as their chief economist in the late 1980s and the in how you say the unfolding of the savings and loan crisis, the 87 stock market crash and various concerns about derivatives or the integrity of the relationship between futures exchanges and the stock exchanges and all these things were were emerging and uh, it was a brutal period yeah really was but uh, and then more recently uh, I I saw you talked about how what you might call the commercialization of entertainment played a big role in, in, in recent years. And uh, I saw a picture of Jay-Z in the book and uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey and, and lots of other people from that, uh, how do you say, that sector. What, what helped them accelerate? Is it related to technology or is it uh, the advent of television? which I guess is another form, another phase of technology. What, what brought entertainment to the, to the surface or to the, to the leadership role? Well, you know, entertainment has obviously been there all along. But it, it seems to me, as I looked at the history, that let's call it the first two-thirds or the first 75% of American business history was about improving the daily lives and generating wealth broadly across uh, the economy, you know, and I think we probably hit kind of an apex in the decades right after World War II. But it was about, you know, fulfilling the basic needs of the population, food, transportation and the like. And that's where the big industries were. But then at some point in time, we reached this very wealthy phase. We really became an extraordinarily wealthy co- country. And that was broadly experienced across the population. And to me, that marks a transition in business history where instead of taking care of the sustenance of life, we're entertaining people. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. entertain people with um, uh, uh, television. We entertain people with drugs and with food. And we entertain people with controversy, as we see on, you know, cable television. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's almost a period in where, you know, the big companies of today take Facebook, you know, that's about folks gossiping. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's not about meeting some, you know, basic survival need of people. It's about teenagers gossiping. It's about, you know, uh, uh, very false rumors being spread. Well, that's just a business. It was difficult to conceive of 50 or a hundred or 150 years ago. We've become a nation where, a huge component of business is just about entertaining the populace more than anything else. Yeah, the rise of tantalization. 
the uh, rise of I love that. <laughs> the uh, I guess it's kind of interesting to bring that into focus as I'm listening to you in relation to the healthcare industry, where people feel something is inadequate and very expensive. That is essential, while tantalization is almost like a, a diversionary tactic. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested what, what your thoughts are at the, on the horizon now. Uh, if, if you were to forecast for me that we'll come back together in 15 years on the, on the 15th chapter of your book, what's at the cutting edge right now? What's, what's going to blossom in this next phase? Well, I want to pick up on something you said there, the, the healthcare industry and the, the growing importance of the healthcare industry. The irony here is that much of what we've done over the last generation or so has been, uh, the result has been to uh, make the health of Americans worse. You know, big food. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're eating Fruit Loops and Cheetos. You know that was that was the big innovation of the big food industry, mm -hmm. uh, the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry, which you know we go into detail about in the book. You know, all of a sudden, one of the the biggest selling drug uh, out of the pharmaceutical industry is Valium. You know, it, it's not a drug to take care of, uh, you know, infections or you know to cure cancer. Or this that it's something to take care of depression. Well, that's that's a manifestation of, I think, the fact that much of what we're doing uh, uh, to provide things to well a wealthy country don't really help that country, make it a less healthy. And I think we've seen more recently that even before COVID, that the average lifespan of American citizens was declining for the first time in history. Mm hmm. Part of that was the opioid epi uh, epidemic. Well, that was a function of business. Uh, so, you know, we, we, our trends on healthcare are, are not to be envied. We're getting less healthy. The healthcare system is, as we all know, fairly dysfunctional. There's no easy path to get from there here to there. Uh, but when I think about the future, a lot of it is about around healthcare, and a lot of it is around genetic engineering. Mm. You know, this is mm. a this is an area that has opened up. Uh, radical breakthroughs are occurring, uh, not only to cure diseases like cancer, but perhaps uh, eventually to alter ourselves physically. Maybe there's genetic reengineering to create a desired characteristic that we don't have. So I think. You know, a lot of the future is going to about, uh, be about altering ourselves, uh, both as it relates to genetic engineering and also as relates to creating a digital environment uh, where we live more and more of our lives digitally instead of physically. You know, the great uh, futurist Ray Kurzweil talks about um, the fact that we are going to be, you know, this is a radical thought, by the way, and I haven't really gotten my head around this, but it's about we're going to actually begin living our lives as avatars instead of in our <laughs> physical bodies. You know, mm -hmm. it, will that be true 20 or 40 or 60 years from now? Ray certainly thinks it will be. Um, so I think altering our reality, both genetically and di digitally, will dominate uh, what happens to us over the next several generations. That, that's fascinating. And I, I know there's kind of a summary statistic I see come out of the OECD with relation to health care which is that the United States is ranked 38th in terms of the quality of health care, and yet its cost is almost double the OECD average and, and is by far and away the most expensive. So there's something not, how do I say, not working well. And I've often, I've often advocated, I, I started my career working in the Republican Party under Pete Domenici, that my, my hawkish friends ought to examine things like the better models of health care to help trim the government budget. It's not just about oppressing people at the lower end of the spectrum or not supporting education or other things that could help 
invigorate our society. Well, I mean, I, you know, when you look historically, there was a point in time, and a lot of this was at, during, and immediately after World War II. Americans were the tallest people in the world, more or less. I mean, you take out some of the smaller countries there, uh, mm -hmm. but we were the tall, tallest with the with the longest lifespans. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not there now. I don't know if you've traveled right lately, but. Neither of those things is as true as it once was. And, you know, that would indicate something very fundamental is going the wrong direction in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know people like uh, the Nobel laureate Joe Stiglitz, whose uh, book, The Price of Inequality, turned a lot of heads. But he's been emphasizing recently how more than half of the American population now has a lower standard of living than they had in 1989 despite all the progress and the productivity that you've seen. And one of the things I noticed uh, that's quite vivid was the acceleration of the size of the wealth of your top ranked wealthiest people in each chapter. It, it looks hyperbolic from say 1970 to the present. It's, it's extraordinary. I mean, when I was a young man, uh, Ross Perot, I think was the wealthiest yeah. person in the United States at, at 2 billion. I'm not even mm -hmm. sure he'd make the list anymore. No. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the other the other thing that goes along with that is the size of mergers and acquisition transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, they were they were very rare. And then we had a couple of we had a, a burst of M&A in circa 1900. And we had our second burst of M&A circa the late 1920s. Uh, well, now we have just an almost perpetual recombination of businesses and, you know, deals that aren't 50 or 100 billion dollars in size barely get mentioned in the wall street journal the, yep. the, the i think that speaks to this growing inequality and this bifurcation that's going on in the country mm -hmm. and it, it also speaks to the political economy where size creates power vis-a-vis -vis the government and uh, i mean we've seen this you and i've talked in the past about the too big to fail banks I see a lot of CEOs at too big to fail banks become budget hawks because they want contingent fiscal capacity to be preserved for their next bailout. They don't want to have a next bailout, but they want the world to know they're not going bankrupt. So their cost of funding comes down and their market share increases relative to small institutions. And so you have all kinds of interactions between politics and economics, but being big matters. Well, I mean, have it, 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 it really is becoming very much like uh, the the later years of the Gilded Age when, you know, uh, companies were so big and politicians were effectively employees of some of these companies. Maybe we're not to that point yet uh, in this era, but I mean, politicians really spend 80 or 90 percent of their time fundraising, and mm -hmm. maybe 10 or 20 percent listening to real constituents and solving I'm, I'm i'm oversimplifying but it's yeah, it's astonishing much. it's it's yeah. it's astonishing how much fundraising uh i have a role uh, fundraising I, have, plays. I have a friend who uh i won't name who used to be a united states senator and i said to him the thing that shocked me when i was in my 20s and working on capitol hill was how much alcoholism was a, sort of a ghost in the senate and he said, yeah, when you spend 70 to 80% of your time fundraising and much of the fundraising is to do things for people that's detrimental to your constituents, the emotional pain and dilemmas that you experience leads you towards drinking. He said, that's it shouldn't surprise you at all. <laughs> that's very interesting. And uh, I know a number of people have left the Senate because they didn't feel like what you might call a deeper sense of purpose could be achieved, given the incentive structures. That it doesn't look like a requires. fun job anymore. <laughs> no, no. And, and that's troubling to me, particularly as what you might call the sophistication, technological sophistication of the economy increases, because you need what you might call sophisticated guidance and control. And if the most talented people say, that's not for me, how can government play the kind of leadership role that you've you know, envisioned or shown us from other periods in your book, but envisioned yeah, as necessary to the future? 
There's often a discussion about how the founding documents of the United States, Constitution, Bill of Rights, etc., are no longer germane, meaning they were principles around a simply an agrarian economy, and now we have a very different structure. Uh, lots of people are very concerned about what you might call the checks and balances across the three major, you know, uh, the courts, the legislature, and the executive branch, because they say it's much easier to block than it is to pass. And so all kinds of entrenched interests can get in the way of the evolution and the progress we need. Do you think we need another constitutional convention yeah. to create, create, a, create a set of principles that maps onto the structure, which is so different than when the country began? Well, it's interesting. Uh, my uh, One of the people I admire the most is Mike Tomaski, who is the editor of both The New Republic and Democracy. And mm -hmm. Democracy has just put out an edition with a new constitution. So ah, if you're, I didn't know that. If, if it's, it is fascinating. And if, you, if you're interested in that, you should, uh, you should check that out. But when I go back to the constitution, I think... Uh, I think the Constitution was designed to obstruct. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Constitution. I won't criticize the Constitution. But you had, the United States had gained independence and um, had not yet brought the Constitution. There was an extended period from 1776 to 18, 1787 where we operated as a confederation and the important documents of that era were the state constitutions. And the most radical of those state constitutions was in Pennsylvania. It created the assembly. There wasn't a governor. I think it was a 15-person committee taking the role as the executive. There were not two houses of Congress. There was only one. It was unicameral. And that was to, to make sure that it was responsive to the needs of the people. So it was a much more shall I use the word, democratic document. And uh, the wealthy folks at that time, many of which I have learned a lot about, admire, uh, really set about to block that kind of thing. They replaced mm -hmm. Pennsylvania's con constitution with uh, one that had uh, two ha houses and a single governor. And in that mechanism, it was much easier to block legislation. Hmm. And so by the time 1787 came around, uh, they knew how to design a document that gave some democracy in terms of the election of the House of Representatives. But senators, as you know, were elected by state legislatures. And the president was elected by an electoral college. Mm -hmm. there, there was very much the intention to construct a document that didn't let things get out of hand, that mm -hmm. that that caused change to occur slowly rather than rapidly. And so, you know, I think that's what we still have today. It's it was it was designed to make things easy to block, mm -hmm. and it's still easy to block things. <laughs> and so, I think the more fundamental question is, do we want a system where it's less easy to block something? And if the answer to that question is yes, we probably do need to make some very fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, reminded, I was recently involved in a seminar related to moral and, moral and ethical design, and my role was to contribute uh, the perspective of Adam Smith. And Adam Smith was a fascinating man because he didn't really espouse principles. He described in the theory of moral sentiment how people come to believe what they do right. through watching someone suffer and saying that could happen to me or seeing someone thrive and saying that's virtuous. And so that, which might call your, uh, your values are a learning by doing. Yep. But then he said, now we should get forward to the wealth of nations. When you look at a system and it's not acting right, 
You don't want to, what you might call, repair it with a lightning bolt. You want it to evolve. You want it to evolve in a, a continuous way that inspires trust. You want it to evolve towards what you might call the ethical asymptotes or, or you know, vision that's evolving in this society. But the, but the human society can lurch backward out of fear of the unfamiliar that created a whole lot of harm. And, and this was fascinating because he had spent some time in France just after or around the time of the French Revolution. And he loved the culture of France and the arts and how these emotional uh, values evolved, but was a little bit terrified by the intensity that the French Revolution brought to the surface. Without question, and, without question. And so I, I, I've never, until preparing for that talk, had so much, uh, we might call deep regard for Adam Smith's wisdom. He had always, and, and fascinating, is when you read The Wealth of Nations, and I read a beautiful book by James Buchan called The Authentic Adam Smith, you find out that he's been used by what you might call free market libertarianism in in great contradiction to what he actually was saying. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think, which I guess what I come back to then is grounding our perceptions in history that's thorough and deep, not selective interpretation of the evidence, helps us to evolve a vision of what is good or what is the right kind of trajectory given the challenges of today. And I think your book plays a very, very uh, strong and constructive role and it's fun. I, I expect people to want to read the next chapter after. I know I, I know how it caught me like a, like a magnetic field. And uh, what did, where did you get the notion to do these portraits of people, these rankings, these the storytelling and the pictures and things. Are, where did that vision come from? That not a lot of books are written like this. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, the um, the book actually almost evolved in the opposite way that a book normally would be. I, I originally conceived of it as a book of lists that hmm. wouldn't have narrative. And um, so, you know, we have the list that you've been kind enough to point out, you know, the wealthiest Americans, or the largest banks, the largest businesses, the, the most important uh, inventions. So we had all these lists that we were pulling together for every era, many of which took a lot of homework. And then we said, well, you know, we can't just have lists. Why don't we have vignettes of some of the important personalities? of that age so the second stage was to come and and by the way there's there's heroes the, the the heroes in the united states were very diverse throughout history and i think that's one of the unexpected things we we find african-american entrepreneurs going far far back we find uh, important and successful women far far back in america's history and so it was fun and important we felt to tell some of those stories and so by the time we kind of laid all that out, we, then we said, well, hell, we might as well go out and write the history too. So That's interesting. That I did, I did notice that, uh, what you might call excavation of the diversity of success. And uh, I think that's very nourishing for the present, uh, meeting the present challenges. Lots of brilliant, creative folk, uh, folks from all walks of life. Yeah, well, I knew that from my work in music and arts, uh, but in many, many aspects of business. Uh, the, I remember, what was the woman's name that worked with Disney World for a while and then went into uh, Garment and other things? And Sylvie, what was her name? Uh, I, I just enjoyed all of these, all of these, what I'll call the good news about people and their capability. Yeah, a lot, a lot of great, a lot of great women, and up to today, we have uh, the CEO of Spanx is 
his profile there. Oprah Winfrey. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah that, the CEO of Spanx is the lady I was referring to. She had worked at Disney World for a while as a prelude, I believe. But uh, Became a billionaire. Yeah. And the, and the gentleman uh, whose last name Johnson, African-American in Chicago. John Johnson, I believe. Absolutely. And, Built a media so, empire. It's very impressive people. You know, that's, how did I say, the, uh, you brought a lot of good news to the table. Well, thank in you. A deal, thank in you. a dark time, and uh, I'm not surprised knowing you, but I am grateful that this book has, uh, how do you say, enlivened our sense of hope and of possibility. Well, you're very kind to say that. What's your, what's your vision of your next book? Well, I actually have uh, several books uh, in the works. Right. One of them is uh, going to be uh, the, the, the great uh, publishing house Polity Press out of Cambridge, uh, England, uh, approached me to write a book on Debt Jubilee, hmm. which uh, hmm. will come out uh, uh, before the end of the year. Uh, we're working on two books beyond that. One of them is just going to be an overall treatise of debt just hmm. to really explicate the entire subject in a comprehensive way that has not been done previously. And I'm very excited about that. And then another one, the other one we're working on, and maybe I'll quit after that with this one, is a biography of Thomas Willett, hmm. who I think was the hmm. most important financial executive in the United States. Uh, he was the across the street neighbor of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, uh, he was the president of the first bank of the United States president of the very first chartered bank in the United States, which was called the Bank of North America, and just this dynamic presence at the inception of the U.S. financial system. Um, and uh, we're trying to put a biography together of him. Yeah, excellent. Well, I do hope you'll uh, agree to come back and uh, share with this podcast each of those works as, you're, as they unfold. And uh, I think... How would I say I'd encourage people to look at your earlier books uh, that brief was brief history of doom uh, was absolutely fantastic. And uh, in this new book, as I've been uttering throughout this last 40 minutes, brought a great deal of joy and a big smile to me. So thank you for your work, Richard. Thank you for your service on the board of INET. And uh, thank you for your concern about our society at this critical juncture. Well, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you.